Welcome to the Legal Connection Show. This is Tony Collins, and uh, I co-host the Legal Connection with Cheryl Jahani. We're two licensed attorneys in Texas, and we our show is on the air from uh, noon to one every Tuesday. Um, you can get us uh, check us out on FM one hundred four point five or FM one hundred six point one. Uh, we also uh, have a repeat of the show and uh, on Facebook and on YouTube, and we're live on Facebook right now. Uh, you can get us at the Legal Connection Show um, on Facebook. So tune in and listen to what we have to tell you about uh, legal issues that affect the community. Um, today's show, we're going to cover three topics. One is uh, what happens after you're arrested and uh, the the probable cause hearing, uh, what the protocol for that in the different courts and what you can expect if someone you know got arrested or if you've got arrested or if you just want to know because they don't really cover that on uh, a lot of the TV shows. You don't see this end of it, but it's important. It's sort of like the first step. Um, we're also going to go over uh, what liability, who and what and when and all the ins and outs of the liability for tree falls as well as dog bites. Um, these are uh, a couple of issues that have come up over the holidays that I've been working on, and so I'm going to uh, sort of give you all that information on it. So Cheryl um, couldn't make it today, so I'm going to be uh, riding solo here, so uh, bear with me. Um, uh, so the first the first uh, category we've got today is probable cause, and um, the the reason this is coming up is because we've I get these calls all the time. I have anguished uh, clients that call me because they've never been arrested before, and then suddenly they've got either a warrant out that they learn about, and we talked about that in the last show, or they've been they they're arrested. They get a knock on the door, and the police are at their door, law enforcement, and they're 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 being arrested. They're being um, interviewed, and then then ultimately they're arrested and. That's a pretty scary thing when you think everything is going fine and then you find out you get a, a letter in the mail from a bond company or a call from a bond company saying you have a warrant out. So now you know you're a wanted person or um, you, which you probably knew you may have had a warrant out. This may not be a complete surprise to you, but but if it was, if you have a warrant out, if there's a mistake, that's, that's uh, you know, going to give you some trepidation. And... The other scenario is if everything is going fine after perhaps you had a fight with your girlfriend or your spouse or there had been some incident that you'd heard about and this happens a lot more than you'd you'd want to a lot more than you'd expect um the police show up at your door to interview you they've either got a warrant and they're showing up to arrest you or they are showing up at your door because there's there's been a a complaint made by somebody and it may ultimately result in an arrest depending on what you say and the first thing I will just once again reinforce, and I say this on every show that we talk about when it, with, with regard to arrest and, and uh, criminal prosecutions, that you have got constitutional rights and you need to use them. This is uh, the America. And uh, the, your most important constitutional right that, that comes out when, uh, when the, with regard to the initial arrest is your right to remain silent, your Fifth Amendment right. Uh, anything you say can and will be used against you, and it will. So although you may want to tell the officer at the door your side of the story, um, and, and sometimes that may be in your best interest to, talk, to say, you know, in your defense what may or may not have happened. But I would, without question, ask whoever's at the door of the officer to not come in. Do not let them in your house by any stretch of the imagination. You might be getting yourself in more trouble. Ask them to please stay at the door. And, and call an attorney, any attorney. Just call them, anybody, you, 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 uh, you saw the billboard, just call an attorney and ask for some advice. The first advice they're going to give you is to say nothing. You have a right to remain silent. The problem is you may be falsely accused of something, but anything you say can be held against you, and it may just add to the narrative that they're looking for that hurts you. So 
uh, please remain silent uh, <laughs> when the policeman is knocking at your door. Um, if they call you and they're being all friendly and they tell you, well, we're just, we, we're just going to get an, a little bit of information for you and we'll let you go. That's, th- don't do that because they can tell you lies and you will say something that will, uh, will affect the case. It's favorable to them. And a- as nice as law enforcement is, they, they are trying to, um, to protect the public and they're the first person that got to them is the complainant and so now you're on the defensive that's why you need a defense attorney or at least uh, exercise your fifth amendment right and so um i i don't even know which case is the best case to use as an example but i'll use the most recent one that i had um i had a client that called me he said that um that there had been uh, just an argument with his wife and that they the, the argument got settled and they went about their business and went to work uh, in their respective jobs and that later on in the evening he got a knock at the door that was the policeman uh, and his wife was there um, asking to speak with them. And um, they said that there had been a complaint filed against him that his wife had called and had and had made some allegations that uh, that he had assaulted her, and he hadn't, so it was a lie. But uh, I guess the wife had made that allegation because he was threatening to divorce her, and she was trying to get, I guess, this get-out-of-jail-free card, so to speak, in her own pocket, have that Trump card to use. I don't know what she was thinking because these two people really, really get along really well, but and they don't have any criminal records, so this was all new to both of them. And I'm not sure... You know, whether, you know, if you, I don't know if y'all have seen those match.com commercials with the devil 2020, you know, uh, looking for uh, a match and the devil saying he filtered out all reason, joy, and all the other uh, good qualities people have. But that was kind of what came to mind was the devil has gotten into some people or something because um, the, the police came to this guy's door. Um, he was honest. He said they'd gotten into an argument. And that's basically, and then he went on to say how, what they argued about, which was nothing. It was just a vertical argument about nothing. It was just a, I can't even believe they argued about what they were arguing about. And um, they, uh, they arrested him. And, uh, you know, so he was in jail. They had a magistrate hearing on the little video at the jail. Uh, They set a, a, a bond for him. They uh, they released him on what's called a PR bond. Um, a lot of times they won't release you on a personal recognizance bond, meaning you don't pay any money. You pay just a little bit of money, and you don't need um, a, a a bonding company to uh, to uh, to vouch for you. Basically, you're you're telling them I will show up. And if I don't show up, I'll pay you a certain amount of money and you can rearrest me or, you know, whatever the conditions are, the PR bond are. But at any rate, um, he got on PR bond. He called me. We had a, a hearing this morning. Um, a lot of times when you hire an attorney, uh, the courts in Harris County, uh, and it may be the same in surrounding counties, all courts are a little different, uh, don't require the defendant to show up as long as there is an attorney that shows up in their place on Zoom because of the, the COVID orders in place. Um, this particular court said, no, um, the, uh, the, the defendant needs to show up. And so I, you know, told them where to go and where to show up. And you go in, you can't get in if you've got a fever or if you've had any exposure. And then, of course, that's just one more um, a layer that you have to work through. I had another client that had been exposed to COVID. They wanted him to show up. I explained he couldn't. They understood. I asked the judge if he wanted him to come in later. He said no. We got a bond set, and and everything was good. But in this case, um, we already had a PR bond, but they wanted my uh, my client to be there, which I really didn't understand because I was just getting a reset. I just needed to look in the files and see what was said and what the allegations were and what evidence there was. And that in order for that to happen, I had to be signed on into the case. And that's what I'll, I'm always going to do this morning. Well, it ends up that in this particular court, the judge um, arraigned him. And the arraignment is the procedure set forth that where the prosecution is reading the complaint that's signed off by a peace officer of what the allegations are and um, and what the evidence is, and the judge hears and determines whether or not there's probable cause and if the case will will 
will continue. And in I will say in in 99% of the cases that I've uh, represented uh, my defendants on, when I've gone to the probable cause hearing, it's just pretty much a rubber stamp. The judge hears what the allegations are. You're innocent until proven guilty, but it's a much lower standard at the probable cause phase. And so the standard to be arrested is reasonable suspicion. It's not a lot there, just reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed. Uh, you go to court and the judge decides whether it be a magistrate judge or the actual judge that's the presiding judge over that court, or even a visiting judge, whoever has the whoever is behind the bench and has the authority to be that judge for that court, uh, will listen to the um, the the evidence and the uh, the affidavit from the peace officer and determine whether or not that higher standard has been met for the case to go forward. Well, um, today they read off the, the probable cause um, information, uh, and this judge um, decided that there wasn't probable cause. So my client had um, been falsely accused, um, there had been evidence presented by uh, an affidavit by the peace officer who wasn't there because the, the call, this arrest happened well after the alleged incident. There were only, The only witness was the person making the complaint. Um, there was no evidence. It was just her word against his. In this instance, the judge said, I'm not, I don't, there's no evidence. I just don't believe that this it could realistically have happened the way the complainant said it happened. And um, he didn't find probable cause, so the case gets dismissed by the judge. If the judge had found probable cause, he would have had the option at that point to um, set different bond conditions to put, uh, you know, to determine whether or not there was alcohol involved, if there needed to be a, a, a home uh, device for, you know, determining whether uh, it, it's like a the car and toxilizer. Uh, it's not an intoxilizer. It's the interlock. You can get a home interlock if you don't have a car. You can get the interlock for your car. Uh, they could set bond conditions that a person can't. A protective order would be set so a person can't uh, come within a certain uh, number of feet from someone's house or their employment. Um, and and a, a litany of things can be set forth for the bond. And at that point, also the prosecution can move for a protective order if it's a family assault type situation. And then those uh, that order uh, will be modified by the judge depending on what evidence he hears and is argued between the two attorneys. And and this particular judge was really, really good because he uh, reads everybody their rights. And he tells them up front, I know you want to get this case done, but... I highly suggest that you talk to an attorney first because um, there are other cases where you have uh, defendants who want to go forward and just want to get it done. They know they did what they were accused of and they just want to plead guilty. And this particular judge was listening to some defendants saying, I just want to plead, telling them, no, I highly recommend that you let me uh, get you a court appointed attorney if you qualify as an indigent and you need to talk to somebody, or I'm going to give you 30 extra days to go talk to an attorney. And and I also, um, even if it was a, just a free consultation, which we, we do a lot, um, you want to run this by an attorney because if you plead guilty, you know, the range of punishment may not be fair. It may be that you need to plead guilty because it is uh, – there's a, I guess, judicial efficacy. If you know you did it, you don't prolong it. You can start your your punishment, whatever you've agreed to, or, or not what you've agreed to, but what if you accept an offer and that's agreeable to you, so you don't go to trial. And you know, there's a whole lot of things that happen after that. But but right now we're talking about that the the arraignment stage. And if you go to court and the judge finds probable cause, um, or even if he doesn't find probable cause, you don't want to say anything. You just want to. Have the when the, well, let me backtrack. If you don't have an attorney and you, you're at the arraignment and they're reading probable cause and the judge asks you some questions, it's still in your best interest to remain silent um, because this is just what the complainant says, and anything you say and do can be held against you. So it, if the judge asks you generic questions like, is this your wife? Do you live together? Do you have money? Where are you staying now? Those don't go toward the actual incident. Those go to where what he's the judge is trying to reason through with regard to what your bond should be, whether it's fair, you know, what you can afford, 
um, what is in the best interest of the public. Um, so he, you can ask answer some questions, but still, I, I wouldn't be answering any questions at all. That's why you want to try to get an attorney there to answer the questions for you. So in today's hearing, I did answer the judge's questions for my defendant, knowing that the, the things that I was saying would be uh, to his in his best interest and would not be something that would be held against him. It would be something I would actually argue in his case. And in this instance, the judge found there was no probable cause. The case was basically dismissed. Um, uh, they can still refile if they find other evidence. Just because the judge didn't find probable cause on this case doesn't mean it can't be refiled in the future uh, with they, if they uh, acquire additional evidence. But um, with regard to, um, um, and I kind of lost my train of thought because I was thinking about them refiling it, uh, uh, the prosecutors, if, if the case, if probable cause is found and the case goes forward and a bond is set and there's bond condition set, that doesn't mean that the prosecution, you can't work something out with them. You still don't want, you'd still, it's still in your best interest. You get, have an attorney present working with the prosecution so that you're not disclosing things and admitting things that hurt your case. Because an attorney can say something that's not an admission because the attorney wasn't there. They're simply representing you. But if, if it's you and you're saying something, that's an admission. You're telling law enforcement something that they can hold against you. So let's say that. But um, you're trying to work out a deal and you have an attorney uh, or maybe you're just really, really good and you know not what not to say and you don't have an attorney. The prosecution still has the option to uh, re- do what's called a NOLI and ask that the and move for the case to be dismissed. Uh, because they know that they can't go forward based on the evidence they have. If you've provided them additional evidence to show that what the complainant has said is not true, or you've got a legitimate affirmative defense, uh, a, a fight, but it was a mutual fight. They pulled a gun on me first. I shot in self-defense, whatever it may be. I mean, those are extreme examples, um, and those are not, not the kind of cases you're going to be able to get dismissed right off. Those are the kind of cases that perhaps a grand jury could know, Bill, if you present that evidence to the grand jury, but um, but the prosecution does have some leverage there. So there's different stages of the case where this stuff can go away. Um, in, in the case of a family assault, um, it could be that it was just, uh, there may have been some alcohol involved, both parties were arguing, there really wasn't an assault at all, it was just... Um, you know, the complainant was upset and called the police. The police arrested with reasonable suspicion. And then uh, later, the uh, complaining witness, being the spouse or the wife or the boyfriend or the, you know, whoever it may be, decides that they don't want to press charges because either they lied or it didn't rise to the level of an actual assault. Or maybe they started it um, and they want to recant. So if that happens and the complaining witness is the one that wants to stop the progress of this now this case it's now a train wreck um then the complainant can go to the district attorney's office and recant the statement and it's not as easy as just calling up the prosecutor and saying it didn't happen i lied you've got to make a a a a written statement in detail uh, generally saying what really happened and sign it and and then submit that to the prosecution. And then at that point, they'll determine whether or not they're even, even going to accept the recant. I've had a lot of uh, complaining witnesses that have recanted. And the prosecution still won't dismiss the case because they say that they were coerced into it or, you know, that it'll happen again. So that is an, another way, another method for family assault cases to go away. It doesn't have to be a family assault case either. It can be any case. It could be a theft. It could be a a uh, car burglary. It could be um, any number of cases. If the complaining witness wants to withdraw the complaint, there's a process to do that. And the prosecution may or may not um, go along with it, but generally they will because if they don't have a cooperating witness and they don't have enough evidence and they really don't have a case to go forward. But but I've had cases where they have no evidence whatsoever. The prosecution just wants to go forward and you know, maybe they don't like me or maybe they've got an agenda, but um, once there's probable cause and you go forward, then the prosecution or a jury uh, or the, the judge at a bench trial, a, a full trial, not just without evidence being presented and admitted formally, is is the only way that the case can um, 
can go away other than doing a plea bargain for a lesser charge or whatever. But but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I'm telling you the the um, the uh, I guess the anatomy uh, and the life of a case where really I was just talking today about probable cause. Okay, so um, probable cause. When you go to the arraignment, sometimes you can. Uh, it's very seldom. It's uh, but a lot of times if you've got a really good reasonable judge. Um, and the judge hears the case and doesn't believe that the complaining witness is telling the truth or doesn't believe that the, the truthful evidence um, goes to the level of the actual charge that is, is before the court, the probable cause may not be found and the case will go away. And that's just a very happy day, and that happened to me this morning. And it was um, beautiful, and I'm just hoping that uh, things work out very well for my defendant, who is uh, my defendant client friend. He is amazing very talented, has no record. There's no reason for this ever to have happened to him during the holidays. Um, I don't know what it is about the holidays. People get, uh, I guess their emotions are a little higher. And with COVID and everybody having to stick around, I guess maybe money issues. Who knows? Who knows why holidays bring out the best and the worst of people. All right. Next topic. Um, trees falling on your property are it either damaging your property or your tree falling on your neighbor's property. What to do? We've had um, cases uh, before. Or, uh, we've talked about this other uh, shows on, on tree falls. But I had another uh, uh, potential client call me and ask me what what she could do. She had a massive, um, it looked like a 100-foot, uh, it appeared to be a pine tree. It could have been an oak tree that was on her neighbor's property that fell onto her house, uh, destroyed the roof, uh, surprised that no one got injured. It, there was significant damage to her house. It's not livable in a livable condition. And um, the way her uh, story went was that she had informed the people that uh, owned the property next door that the there was a a, a tree that was hanging over her property that was in bad condition that looked like it would fall on her property and ask that they trim it because um, if there there's it's a trespass if someone's tree grows over your fence or over your property line you're well within your rights to trim the limbs if they're over your property line but it's always best to work it out with your neighbor first because it is their tree maybe they want to remove the tree but if somebody's got uh, a, a tree limbs tr uh, that are on your property you're well within your rights to trim that part of the tree that is extended over your property and um however if the roots of the tree uh, are and the, the the basic you know the, the tree itself is on your neighbor's property it's their tree and if you go cut those roots you may have a liability issue if that tree dies what if it's a hundred year old oak tree that's got you know it's historic value and you go cut or poison the roots that are on your side and it kills this tree and let's say they can prove that maybe there's some bad blood between y'all um you may have a lot of liability for killing their tree because the tree wasn't really harming anything and you just wanted to get rid of the tree because let's say it was blocking your your uh, view or blocking your billboard or it was th there was some issue with the tree or maybe you just didn't like your neighbor and you wanted to get rid of the tree. You can't go around killing trees. Um, you can work something out with your neighbor. If it's a danger and, they d and you've warned them and they knew about it, and we'll go into a little bit more of the the uh, the legal technicalities of that, and they don't take it down there, some liability on their side. But here's the law on fallen trees. Um, homeowners are responsible for what falls into their own yard. So if a storm causes your neighbor's tree to fall in your yard, it is your homeowner's insurance that covers the cost of removing the tree and remedying the damage it caused on your property, of course, after your deductible. So if you can see that there's a big tree next door and it's right on the property line, but it's on the other side of the fence and it's a hundred feet tall and it's very near your roof and you're worried about it because it sways in the wind, but it's a healthy tree. And you tell your neighbor, um, you need to remove that tree because it's going to hurt my property. And they said, no, I love my tree. It's my tree. Um, it was here when you moved here, whatever the case may be, we're not going to take the tree down. And then the next day, the tree, and let's say you've written letters, certified letters. Let's say it wasn't the next day. Let's say it was the next month. And that tree falls on your house. 
um, then your in, your homeowner's insurance is what covers the, the cost of that damage. There's really nothing you can do about it. Um, hopefully, uh, if you've got homeowner's insurance that had, you know, all risk, wind damage, lightning damage, you've got a policy that, that covers maybe even tree falls and you're home free. But the uh, wind and lightning are generally covered perils and your standards homeowners ho3 homeowners policy or they are included in a homeowners all risk policy so you need to look at your policy if a tree falls on your house your homeowners insurance may or may not cover the cost of the tree cleanup depending on your policy uh, so you'll need to review it it will likely cost subject to the sublimits, the removal of the fallen tree if it's due to the covered peril, such as a storm. Um, so, But let's just say the tree fell and there wasn't a storm. There wasn't even any wind. It just fell over. Oak trees do that. They've got shallow roots. Um, if your neighbor's tree... Now, if your neighbor's tree was dying or dead, that's a different story. Um, then your neighbor is liable for the negligence of not mitigating the damage. However, it's your burden as the homeowner who was damaged to prove the tree was dying or dead and that the homeowner who had the tree um, didn't was negligent because this is a negligence case. Um, if a tree falls on your fa- house, and I'm just saying this is like for the, the person that's tree did fall in their house, and certainly this is going to happen um, maybe after a rain. We've had some windstorms. Um, you know, we live in a very uh, highly treed, uh, wooded area around here, and it's not uncommon for trees to fall over. If a tree falls on your house, the first thing to do is, if it's safe, is to try to prevent further damage to your home and property. Make sure to take some photos to document what happened. Then call your insurance agent. Um, you can explain. He or she will explain your options and help you understand if and how to file a claim. Um, so call your agent first. You may not want to file a claim because you don't want to up your insurance. It may be that your deductible is so high that you can cover this without actually making a claim. So call your agent first. They'll know they're not going to call the claim in. They're not going to hurt you. They want your business. They want you to get insurance with them the next year. That's how they make money. So call them first and kind of find out what your options are with them. Uh, If you do file a claim, when you file a claim, a claims adjuster will come by to evaluate the damage and explain how your homeowner's policy comes into play. Um, It's recommended that you call your claims adjuster before you contract to have the tree removed so that they can see what's going on, so they can look at what the damage is. So they can, if it was a dead tree, you'll know what your options are, all right? Um, Sometimes trees fall on cars. If it's not safe or possible to remove the tree from the car yourself, you should call a professional to remove it. Again, talk to your insurance agent and a claims adjuster first. Take photos of the fallen tree on your car. Depending on the damage and the terms of the insurance coverage, your optional comprehensive insurance for your car uh, under your auto policy may also provide coverage for the loss. So you have two different kinds of uh, policy coverage that you're looking at. Now, um, preventing tree damage. Preventative measures matter when it comes to trees. Start by looking for signs of distress, such as dead limbs, cracks in the trunk or major limbs, leaning to one side or branches that are close to the house or a power line. Mushroom growth on the roots or the bark can also signal trouble that you've got a diseased tree. Homeowners should be concerned about the health of their trees. It's possible for you to be held responsible for the resulting damage to your neighbor's house or property if your tree falls due in whole or in part to your own neglect. One of the best things to do is to regularly have your large trees trimmed. And that just comes to mind um, about what happened to Governor Abbott. He was just jogging along the street, and my understanding is a tree limb fell on him, and that paralyzed him, and that's why our governor um, has been paralyzed. And And he was an athlete. He had made it through college. I believe he went to UT. Um, uh, I think he may, may have even made it through law school at that point. But he was a young guy, healthy, athletic, and a tree fell on him. Well, he did sue, and he won a lot of money because of the negligence of the person 
who did not take care of the tree that fell on him. All right. And it didn't hurt that I believe at the time he was a lawyer. He had he had the wherewithal to contact a lawyer and they sued for that. So there's a lot of things that come into play when a tree falls. Um, but don't automatically think that if the tree fell and it was your neighbor's tree that fell on you that um, that it's their fault. It could be that the tree was perfectly healthy and it was an act of God. Um, it could be the tree was perfectly healthy and it was just, you know, the roots were not well rooted and it fell. Um, so there's a lot of different things that come into play. Um, you can, I, I think my first call would be, well, the first thing I would do was I would make sure everybody was okay. Because if you've got, uh, you know, live electrical wires, you get hurt that way if it's during a storm. Uh, they could have brought the wires down when the tree fell. Uh, there's there's some dangers involved. So first, make sure that you're protected and you're safe. Um, the next thing I would do is I would be calling my insurance agent and a tree guy. Uh, insurance agent first, uh, taking pictures, and then tree guys, they they know how to, if the tree is only half fallen over, they can immediately get out there with their chainsaws and they are, I have a tree guy right now, they are amazing. They've got the, the little things that they can crawl off the trees, the little shoe things. Uh, they know where to cut so that more damage isn't caused. Uh, they, they've got the shredders. They, uh, so first, first, are you safe? Second, you want to call your insurance agent. Uh, third, before anything's moved, you want to take some pictures. Um, and uh, fourth, you want to get with the tree guy so that you can operate. And if your house isn't livable, uh, you definitely want to call your insurance agent because even if the, the, the person who had the tree was negligent, you may not have a case in place fast enough for you to, uh, to be able to live. Uh, so you may need to file a claim under your own coverage, and then your agent will come through. And they are amazing. They will represent you legally if there was negligence on the person that had the tree that fell apart. But um, always talk with your neighbor. Uh, the person that called me did the right thing. They talked to their neighbor. The tree fell anyway. I haven't seen, um, you know, I, I haven't gotten far enough in this case to know, you know, what the, the issues were, whether it was storm damage or there was, uh, you know, it was negligence on the neighbor's part. But uh, my client apparently is safe, uh, and they're being taken care of, uh, hopefully through their insurance company. And, um, so that's, that's the, 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 the way it works with, uh, with the uh, tree falls. Um, homeowners are responsible unless, uh, for anything that falls in your own yard. And that would be, even if a meteor fell out of space, there may be some negligence with whoever it belonged to, or maybe a drone or whatever, but, if there was no negligence, you still have your homeowner's policy to fall back on. Good to have homeowner's insurance. Um, all right. So the last thing we're going to talk about in today's show is dog bites. And, um, you know, we get, uh, there's a lot people have their pets. They walk their pets. People are responsible for their pets. And people are usually well-meaning with their pets. Um, so you have to look at it from both sides of the coin. You've got somebody that has a dog. They love their dog. It's a Rottweiler. You know, it may be a pit bull. It may be a mixed breed. It may be just a big dog that doesn't like cats or kids or whatever. Uh, but they're walking them. And this dog may not have ever shown any, um, you know, uh, dangerous, uh, uh, I guess, uh, features or, or actions toward people. And then all of a sudden the dog gets loose and bites the, the mailman or, or bites somebody. And that person is now injured or maybe severely injured. And, and so, and so what do you do? Um, there are, uh, I guess the first thing you want to do, know is that there's an ordinance about dangerous dogs and animals. And so you want to look first to the person that's got the animal. So if you're a, a, a dog owner, be aware that if you're in the Montgomery County area and in Conroe, there's actually a city ordinance that uh, is directed directly toward um, what happens if your dog injures somebody or something. And it's the Conroe Sydney Ordinance, uh, Section 10.1. Um, and here's, I'm, I'm just going to read it to you. So it's kind of interesting. Um, there's also, and, and I'm going to go backtrack just a little bit. Um, you're for this Conroe ordinance to be in effect, you have to actually be in the Conroe city limits. So if it appears that your property is in the Conroe city limits, not just the ETJ, um, then you fall within the, the parameters of this particular city ordinance. If it's not, then you can go toward a, a, a county ordinance 
or a state ordinance. Okay, there might be some federal laws on it too, but I don't know if you want to really get that far with a dog bite. Um, if you are not in the Conroe City limits and you're in the ETJ, then you can look to the Texas Health and Safety Code. Um, under the Texas Health and Safety Code, a dog is considered dangerous when, and, and we're only talking about dangerous dogs because because if the dog, you know, was a a little chihuahua and it was at a mall and, you know, it didn't really hurt you, but let's say you're afraid or maybe you, you had, uh, you know, trepidation about it. It may not be a dangerous dog. So we're just talking about dangerous dogs here and here are the definitions. A dog is considered dangerous when it causes bodily injury under the Texas health and safety code to a person in an unprovoked attack. So your kids can't get on over there, you know, uh, taunting your neighbor's dog or a dog, someone walking their dog down the street or in the dog park, and causes a person to believe that the dog will attack and cause bodily injury. The Conroe Ordinance says it includes any dog running at large that makes an unprovoked attack on a domestic animal that causes serious bodily injury or death, and the attack occurs off the dog owner's property. All right, so it's a whole different ball game if the if the dog is within the confines of the the dog owner's property. All right, after a dog has been declared dangerous. Uh, by the law enforcement, if you call them, the ordinance requires that the owner to spay or neuter the animal and register the dog with an animal co- with animal control and have a microchip implant tag implanted and provide a secure enclosure. So once this dog has gotten out with an unprovoked attack and and maybe bitten a, you or you know, uh, it doesn't really take much to, uh, well, this says serious bodily injury. So I guess, I guess any dog bite would be a serious bodily injury because there could be rabid and it's, you can't really detect whether someone's got rabies or someone, whether a dog has rabies until they've actually, my understanding from talking to the veterinarian um, was they can only determine that after they put the dog down. Um, but I'm not a veterinarian, so I can't say that for sure. Um, after a dog has been declared dangerous, the ordinance requires the owner to, and as we said, have been spayed, registered uh, the dog with animal control, a microchip implanted, and you've got to now uh, provide a secure enclosure. The enclosure or kennel must be nine-gauge chain link fence with walls at least eight feet tall, covered with a top or a roof, have a concrete floor at least four inches thick. So basically, you've imprisoned this dog once they've uh, attacked somebody and, and uh, uh, had a serious body injury or death. I'm surprised that the ordinance doesn't have them put down, but it doesn't. Um, the enclosure also should have an automatic closing and lack- latching mechanism and a lock. Also, a dangerous dog signs must be posted and visible from each street for providing access to the owner's property. When the dog is not in an enclosure, it must be muzzled and held on a leash at not more than six feet long by a person 18 or older. The city can fine owners $500 if their dog is declared dangerous and has injured a person or an animal. So basically, you've got so many requirements once this dog has injured somebody. And this is only, this is a Texas Health and Safety Code. It could be that if you're, uh, that the Montgomery County Ordinance or a particular city that you're with, you're in will have a stronger uh, uh, penalty than what the Texas Health and Safety Code provides. So this is only the state level. You've got to look at all the different levels. The the Conroe Ordinance, if you're within the 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 city limits of Conroe, describes uh, has a, a little bit of a different meaning. An animal is any any animal uh, can be considered dangerous. Um, it means a bird reptile or mammal other than a human being including but not limited to dogs and cats of all breeds if this animal can uh, you know so they're basically the first defining animal at large means that the animal is not under the control of the owner either by leash chain or cord or other suitable attached suitable material attached to the collar or is not restrained securely securely within an enclosure or fence cat means a a feline of both feline genders <laughs> um felis is what they're saying felis catus which is the latin term for cat a dangerous animal means any animal that is defined as a quote dangerous animal by the texas health and safety code 
section 822.101, or an animal or any species of wild or feral mammal or reptile that by its nature or breeding is capable of inflicting serious bodily injury or death to a human. A dangerous dog has the meaning given at the Texas Health and Safety Code at Section 822.041 and also includes any dog running at large that makes an unprovoked attack on a domestic animal. So if a dog is running at large and even uh, makes an unprovoked attack on your cat, dog, chihuahua, um, anybody. I mean, an attack would be uh, coming forward and even threatening to attack you. That would be... I think uh, at least uh, in in the criminal code, an attack would be the fear of an attack. But I don't want to go that far with let's just say that there was actual, you know, a a touch. But I think most people know what an attack is. Um, Dog means both male and female dogs. Owner means any person owning or keeping or harboring or having control or custody of an animal. Serious bodily injury to an animal means any injury to an animal characterized by severe bite wounds or severe ripping or tearing of muscle that would cause a reasonably prudent owner to seek veterinary treatment for the injured animal, regardless of whether or not treatment is actually sought. Okay. Um, So I guess the bottom line is if somebody brings, uh, if somebody fears that their animal has been injured or if they bring them to the veterinary, it can be deemed a serious bodily injury because serious bodily injury is a, um, uh, what do I say? It's a, uh, it's going to be, it's objective, okay? Uh, Not subjective. Did I say that right? Subjective means uh, there's a lot of leeway by whatever the, Objective, I, I said it wrong, it's subjective. Subjective is the person that determines that or looks at it. So um, so if uh, you've got, and in one of the cases, and I'll use an example, I had a client that called me that said that she, her, her cat was sitting on her porch and there was a, a neighbor, really a sweet person, a real, just a really, really nice neighbor, lived in a, a, a very nice neighborhood, um, was walking their dog, and the dog um, uh, just ran out from the, the the confines of the owner, which was just a few feet ahead of them, uh, I guess because it saw this cat. And the cat was just sitting on the owner's front porch like it always does. And the dog, um, I believe, was a pit bull mix, and it uh, attacked this. Um, in fact, it's better if I just kind of read out what, what happened. The defendant's dog entered plaintiff's, plaintiff's premises on plaintiff's front porch, uh, the plaintiff's uh, cat of 15 years was asleep on the plaintiff's front porch. Uh, the uh, because I'd, I'd filed basically uh, drafted a lawsuit for this. Defendant's dog unexpectedly and viciously attacked the plaintiff's domestic cat, which all of this was captured on the plaintiff's ring security video. And this uh, dog attack would have occurred, and we they would she wouldn't have known what have would have happened or been able to save her cat had it not been for her ring security video. And um, she heard the cat, but she jumped up really fast and didn't get to the door until after uh, the dog already had the the cat in its jaws. Um, The defendant's pit bull had the plaintiff's pet in its mouth and was shaking it so hard uh, that it was pounding on the front door, and that's what alerted her to the attack. Um, And in this case, she wouldn't have known... she, She wouldn't have known who owned the dog had it not been for the ring security video because she was able to go back and look at the video later and it captioned on the video. Um, Plaintiff's cat was near death um, because it was being shaken. Uh, It suffered internal damage, had multiple bite and scratch injuries. Um, It was uh, clearly unprovoked. The cat was just sitting on the porch and it was covered by the the ring security video. Uh, The plaintiff attempted to save the cat and repel the unprovoked attack plaintiff suffered from fear and anxiety because the the defendant's dog almost attacked her when she tried to chase it off. Um, She was able to determine who the owner of the dog was because her ring video captured who the owner was. And uh, we contacted the owner who agreed to pay for the damages. And um, because there was serious bodily injury within the Conroe city limits, um, there was, uh, the law enforcement went out and asked for the um, 
the the ordinance to be invoked, basically. And I believe that the the owner went forward and and tried to take care of it with getting the the chip and their dogs and all the other things that you need to take care of when your your dog is a serious risk. It ends up that her dog had done this before. It also ends up that it was a very sweet family pet, and that both in both sides of this this incident was very sad. Fortunately, the cat lived. Uh, and and it, so it, it turned it worked out that the the owner of the dog paid for the damages it ends up the owner of the cat was able to take care of it and the, the cat survived so it did have a happy ending but but that's what happens when there's a dog attack so I am giving been given information by station manager Dick that uh, that we need I need to wrap up um, next week's show is going to be on contracts there's been a few new. Uh, Texas Supreme Court and Supreme Court cases with the United States that talk about uh, interpretation of contracts and how you're affected. And we're going to talk about how it affects you as a homeowner uh, in your homeowners association contracts and how you interpret those and and what you do if your homeowners association comes after you for a a a, a cause that is not uh, an actual uh, uh, covenant. In other in other words, you have not. Um, you have in, in no way uh, not complied with your covenants and they say you have. We're going to talk about how you get around that and how that applies to your contract law with these new cases that have come out. So um, uh, uh, join us on Facebook. You can look at listen to today's uh, broadcast on Facebook later on today. It'll be on in about an hour. We have a YouTube. Uh, you can listen to us on uh, next week at noon on FM 104.5. Our FM 106.1, this Legal Connection Show. And remember to um, serve God by serving others. We'll see you next week.